Flat Earth Experiments Determining the shape of the Earth using tools, observations, and measurements you make yourself, all in your own backyard. Part 6. Size of the Moon This video will detail the first of five moon observations. In this moon series, you'll need to have a good quality digital camera. The camera on your smartphone will not be good enough. Taking good quality images of the moon can be tricky, so we definitely recommend that you Google photographing the moon. If you saw our video number two on size of the sun, you'll find this video copies much of the content from that one. In order for this video to stand alone, we include all the geometry content here. We do have new content in the form of zenith size and the comparison between apogee and perigee. Here's a quick overview. We're going to record the visible size of the moon at several times during the day or night, at the horizon and at the moon's highest point, or zenith. The flat earth model says the moon moves towards the viewer at moonrise and away at sunset, at moonset, thus the size should change. The globe earth model has the moon essentially at the same 239,000 mile distance, with moonrise and moonset due to the earth's rotation, thus the size shouldn't change appreciably. Supplies. You'll need a decent digital camera with a good zoom. You won't get a good enough results with a smartphone camera. A tripod is important or some other means of stabilizing your camera. Optionally, you can use the solar clinometer we made in video number five and also use the compass bearing diagram from that same video. It's not essential to have the elevation in azimuth when we record the, the moon's size, but it is nice to have. Here's the plan of attack. We'll learn some important tips in photographing the moon. Then we'll actually take moon photos and record the measurements in whatever units work for you, such as inches, millimeters, or pixels. The next step is optional, standardizing the data. This will convert your units to a standard measurement, diameter in degrees or arc minutes. This will be helpful if you want to compare your results with others or make comparisons with your own observations at a future date. Lastly, we'll take a look at the two models for the shape of the Earth and describe how our moon measurements might relate to the flat earth model or the globe model. Step one, photographing the moon. This section will also detail how we can use our solar clinometer and a compass bearings diagram. There's a great little article on the web by Mike Panic at Light Stalking, which gives some great advice. I'll cover the basics here. First is focus. The autofocus mechanism in a camera will have a lot of trouble with the moon. So you'll get the best results setting your camera to manual focus and set it to infinity. Next is exposure. Like focus, the camera has a lot of trouble with a very bright light surrounded by black sky, such as the moon at night. So you can either change the light meter setting to spot or use manual exposure, where you select your own aperture and shutter speed. A good starting point is f11 at a 60th of a second. Your camera should also be set to ISO 100 sensitivity. It's important to note that only a full moon spends most of its path across the night sky. All other phases of the moon will spend at least part of their time in daylight. Your exposure with a blue sky will be very different, and you might get away with auto exposure. Next, you want to use a tripod and a self-timer to steady your camera. Self-timers usually come in two kinds, two or ten seconds. You've probably used the ten-second version to jump into the frame, which is why they call it a self-timer but the two second version is to eliminate camera shake. Press the shutter, then hold your breath, and the camera should be rock steady two seconds later when the shutter clicks. Lastly, there's zoom. Find a good zoom level that will bring the moon almost full frame and make sure that every photo you take of the moon is at this exact same zoom level, since we'll be making comparisons with the diameter. We can't emphasize this point enough. Keep the same zoom value for every photo. Here's a summary for how to photograph the moon. Set your focus to infinity, set your camera for ISO 100 for the best quality, and set the aperture to f11 or f16 with a shutter of a 60th of a second, and use a tripod with a two second self timer. Lastly, you'll want to bracket your exposures. This means that you take one photo, then adjust one setting slightly, and then take another, and then repeat a third time. Then use the feedback to see which settings are best. But remember that things like daylight and weather might affect your pictures. Optional, using or modifying a solar clinometer. A solar clinometer starts with a pencil, which you punch through a small scrap of cardboard. 
you then tape a flat side of a protractor to the pencil, and pass some dental floss or sewing thread through the vertex hole on the protractor, and secure it, hanging a clip on the end for a pendulum weight. Here's a picture of the completed solar clinometer. If you take readings at night with a bright moon, you may be able to use it just like we did with the sun. Simply aim the pencil at the moon, and then align it so that the shadow of the pencil disappears from the cardboard. Or, if you're using it with a dim moon or during the day, you can simply remove the cardboard and sight along the pencil. Since you can't look at the moon and the protractor at the same time, pinch the thread onto the protractor to preserve the angle. To get the moon's elevation, subtract the protractor reading from 90 degrees. For example, if our protractor read 39 degrees, we'd subtract 90 minus 39 to result in a 51 degree angle of elevation. The second optional tool you can use is a compass bearings diagram, which you can print from the internet. North corresponds to 0 degrees azimuth, and east is 90 degrees azimuth. Using your knowledge of due north at your location, align the diagram and place it either on a table in front of you or on the ground. Then, when you sight in on the moon, you can record the azimuth of its location. In this video series, we emphasize measurements you make yourself, without relying on others. But you might find some trustworthy resources which can be useful. You might find mooncalc.org to be an interesting source of data, but only if you find it to be reliable for you, in your experience. Once you enter your location, you can read the moon's elevation and azimuth at any hour of the day, on any date, circled in red, here. Step 2. Taking measurements. Again, you'll record your data in a dedicated notebook, either using a simple, inexpensive composition notebook or a field notes notebook. You'll want to record the official moonrise moonset times for your location, using either your local newspaper or a website, such as mooncalc.org. This will help frame the times of your moon observations. Each time you take photos, record the time and date of the photo, along with the exposure information. It will also be helpful to frame the date of your observation in the 28-day moon cycle, so finding out the date of apogee and perigee will be helpful. We'll describe how in a few slides. Lastly, you can optionally record the moon's azimuth and elevation. If you find that your values agree with mooncalc.org, then you might find it to be a trusted resource. Don't forget that each time you make your moon measurements, repeat the procedure three times while bracketing your exposure. This will ensure that you capture the best possible photo of the moon each time. So how often should you photograph the moon? At a minimum, you'll want to record the measurements twice, when the moon is near the horizon, at either moonrise or moonset, and at zenith, the highest point of the moon in the sky. To find the time of zenith, simply find the halfway point between moonrise and moonset. Even better will be to bookend the zenith observation with both moonrise and moonset observations. And if you're ambitious and really want to act like a scientist, record observations once an hour for the entire time the moon is above the horizon. Please note that especially with methods 2 and 3, you'll be taking some of your photographs with a bright sky. This will affect your exposure, so be prepared. It's very helpful to be aware of when the moon's apogee and perigee is, or when the moon is furthest and closest to the Earth. A nice website is astropixels.com, which lists these events, plus other ones such as moon phases and data on the planets. Notice in this calendar of July 2016, the moon will be at perigee on July 1st and 27th, and at apogee on the July 12th. An alternative to astropixels is to simply Google moon apogee perigee dates. Here's a sample logbook template for your moon size data. Pause the video here if you'd like to record the details. Step 3. Standardizing the data. Optional only if you want to compare data with others or with yourself at a later date. Standardizing means we'll convert our moon photos into an angular diameter measurement in either degrees or arc minutes. To standardize, start by snapping a daylight photo of a reference object, in this case a standard sheet of office paper, either 8.5 by 11 letter size paper or A4 paper. Using the same zoom as your moon images, at a known distance, either 50 yards or 50 meters. 
To set up this procedure, go to a local football field and set up your camera at the 50-yard line and tape a sheet of office paper to a yardstick stuck in the turf at the goal line. You can use a similar procedure anywhere you can accurately measure, either 50 yards or 50 meters. An 11-inch tall paper at 50 yards is exactly 0.35 degrees, and an A4 sheet of paper at 50 meters results in 0.34 degrees, which we'll use in our proportion to compare it to our moon images. We just want to compare the image of the moon to the image of the paper, so it doesn't matter what units we use as long as we're consistent. Make sure you open each image with 100% magnification so you're comparing apples to apples. You can measure the image in pixels, such as using your own software. Otherwise, you can simply hold a ruler up to your computer screen and measure the two images to find M and P. Since the sheet of paper measures 0.35 degrees, we'll use M and P in this equation, based on a proportion, to give us moon diameter in degrees. Substitute 0.34 if you used A4 paper at 50 meters. The moon is about half a degree when viewed from Earth, so you might find it more helpful to convert to arc minutes. There are 60 arc minutes per degree, so you just need to multiply your degrees by 60 to get arc minutes. Step 4. Flat Earth versus Globe Analysis Again, in this series of 15 videos, we're only considering two models, the Flat Earth model and the Globe Earth model. We'll start by looking at the behavior of the moon in both models, so we can make sense of our data. The moon follows a very similar path to the sun, with a 5 degree or less difference in the two paths. This means that we can use an identical set of calculations for our moon distance that we used for our sun distance. This will allow us to relate it to apparent moon size in the sky. Before we look at the flat earth model, please note that the flat earth map might not be perfect, but there are several things that are not in dispute. The relative positions are correct. For example, the North Atlantic is west of Europe, and North America is west of the North Atlantic. The distances to the North Pole from anywhere on the Gleason map are precise. Both the Flat Earth map and the Standard Globe are in exact agreement with regards to distance from anywhere to the North Pole. In the Flat Earth model, the Moon follows a circle, very close to the Sun's path, above the equator for spring and fall, or slightly smaller or larger circles above the tropics for winter and summer at 3,000 miles elevation. In our mathematical analysis, we'll assume the moon is above the equator, which happens multiple times each year, near the fall or spring equinoxes. Let's zoom in and just focus on the map north of the equator, with our target location being Missouri in the United States. Again, we're being very general here, just to get a sense of proportional distances. This diagram shows the locations of the moon at moonrise, zenith, and moonset, assuming 12 hours of moonlight, such as near the equinox. We'll try to compute the distance of the moon to an observer in Missouri at moonrise, zenith, and moonset. This is a 2D view, so it's hard to see the actual distances, since the moon is 3,000 miles in elevation. Switching to a 3D view and using colored right triangles, we can see the hypotenuse of each right triangle shows the distance of the moon to Missouri. We'll plug in map distance and the 3,000 mile moon elevation into the Pythagorean theorem to find each hypotenuse. If we do the math, we find that at zenith, the moon is exactly twice as close to southern Missouri than at moonrise or moonset. If you repeat the procedure with an observer elsewhere on the flat earth map, you'll find the difference to be often more dramatic. This table goes from the north pole at the top to the Antarctic ice wall at the bottom, with the equator in the middle. Here's a world map, easier to read than the Gleason's map, with how much bigger the moon will appear at zenith. You could read between the lines to approximate for your location. For example, in London, it will be about 1.6 times as big, while in Cape Town, it will be about 2.9 times. Now let's discuss the Globe Earth model. The Globe Earth model has the moon 239,000 miles away. This is a scale image for the actual distance from the Earth to the moon. The moon orbits the Earth about every 28 days, and the Earth's rotation gives us moonrise and moonset. In the Globe Earth model, the moon doesn't change distance from an observer on Earth in one 12-hour cycle of viewing. Thus, it should remain about the same size in one day or night. For those of you who are able to make high-quality images of the moon at both the horizon and at zenith, we've got bonus points for you. Other than the orientation of these images, do you see another difference? 
the moon on the right is 1.2% smaller, representing the moon at the horizon. Let's take a top-down view from above the North Pole using a simplified diagram that is not to scale. This represents six hours of viewing, where the Earth is rotating, not the moon. Thus, the moon's distance to the Earth is not changing. If we consider the vantage point of an Earth observer on the equator, we see that at zenith, the moon is a full Earth radius, about 4,000 miles, closer to the moon than when viewed at the horizon. Switching to a side view, we can see how the observer's latitude will affect this difference. For simplicity's sake, we'll again assume the moon is above the equator, such as near the equinoxes. Notice our observer isn't exactly one Earth's radius closer, but a bit less. If we take the cosine of the latitude theta, we can find the actual distance closer to the moon at zenith, shown with the purple arrow. We can calculate how much closer, as a percent, using this equation. 3,959 times the cosine of theta times 100 divided by 239,000. For an observer, at 40 degrees north latitude, the zenith moon will appear to be 1.27% larger than at the horizon. Some final thoughts on measuring this 1% difference. Your atmospheric conditions must be ideal, with no haze or clouds to degrade your images. You need very large, high-quality images at both zenith and at the horizon. The edges of the moon must be crisp. And you may need to be proficient with photo editing software to make exact measurements, such that a 1% difference in size is detectable. You might need to use rotation, layering, and transparency. Next, we'll look at how apogee and perigee might affect your size of the moon measurements over a period of weeks. In the globe Earth model, perigee is when the moon is closest to the Earth on its elliptical orbit, and apogee is when it's furthest, a difference of about 10%, which is dramatically distorted in this diagram, which is not to scale. If you carefully standardize the way you take images, using a consistent zoom every time, for example, you can compare your results over a span of weeks, or even longer. For example, this pair of images was taken seven months apart, the one on the left being known as a supermoon, when a full moon coincides with perigee. Here's another pair of images taken by David Lynch only 11 days apart, not exactly at apogee and perigee, but close enough to see the difference. Notice the reference bar measured in arc minutes for comparison. To summarize the globe Earth model, the moon is essentially the same distance away in one day or night's worth of viewing. Thus, the zenith moon should be about the same size as at the horizon. Under ideal conditions, you might find it to be about 1% larger at zenith. If you take images over a span of weeks and pay attention to the apogee perigee of the moon, you'll find that the perigee moon to be 10% closer, thus 10% larger. To review the two models, in the flat earth model, moonrise and moonset are caused by the moon moving towards or away from the viewer. In the globe earth model, Moonrise and moonset are caused by the rotation of the Earth, with the moon staying about the same distance away. How does your data about moon diameter relate? If it appears to be much bigger at zenith than at the horizon, this supports the flat Earth model. If it stays more or less the same, this supports the globe Earth model. Do you want to share your results? YouTube user Cara Diane has created message boards for folks to share the results of these flat Earth experiments. This is not a forum to debate Flat Earth versus Globe Earth, but rather one for folks to share their results when they do the experiments. We've included a link in the description box of this video. Come join us. Please remember that the results of this experiment won't necessarily prove the Flat Earth versus the Globe Earth. They simply might support one model over the other. To be more certain, more data gathering is needed as our series continues. Our next video is number seven, Speed of the Moon. It will require the same tools as this video, especially the tripod. When commenting on this or any other video, please keep an open mind and remember to be kind to each other. Practice what Stephen Covey recommends. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. Thank you.